Uh, we are starting our last week in our discussion about spiritual gifts, and we've been doing that in Ephesians 4, and we'll do the same thing today. And as we start it, I thought I would start by sharing some encouraging uh, verses from Ephesians. Um, the first encouraging thing is, is, as we look at this today is that as Christians, in one sense, we are not very different. In fact, the difference between all Christians in one sense, is very, very small. No matter your age, no matter the century in which you grew up, it doesn't matter. In one sense, the difference between all Christians is very small. And I want to show you based on what Paul said in Ephesians 4, starting in verse 4. Paul said, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called into one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. One. All. Do you hear him repeating that over and over again? Now, I don't know how some of you have felt at different points in your life, but if you have ever felt that maybe your story, maybe your testimony is a little too bland, uh, it's not as movie quality as some others, Maybe you feel like the ministry you have to offer and what you could contribute to God's kingdom is small. If you've ever felt like that, I want to put those feelings to rest and call them out for the lie that they are. Because that is not true. I want you to know about the one who just said all of these things. These are the words of Paul himself. This is a guy who actually met the resurrected Christ on a road and became blind as a result and then miraculously had Jesus restore his sight. That's his story. This is someone who is historically the greatest church planner in the world and arguably one of the greatest church thinkers that has ever lived. This is a person who affected an entire empire, the largest and most powerful one at its time. For the gospel. And that guy says there's one body, one spirit, one baptism, one hope. He lumps you and me into his story. The, the miracle of Paul's story and the, the magnificence of his ministry is no different from yours and mine. He's not putting himself on a pedestal and out way above everyone else. That's not what's going on. And sometimes I've heard people say this to me, which, boy, it, just, it, it, makes, it makes me cringe a bit. It, I hate how it sounds. They've said, well, I'm not as good a Christian as I ought to be, or I'm not as good a Christian as so-and-so. And that is a complete lie. There's no adjective. You are either saved by grace or you're not. And if you are, there's no varsity and junior varsity. There's just all Christians. There's one body, one faith, one story. We're all saved by grace. And no matter what form that takes, it is a mighty miracle that's worth celebrating and shouting. So that's how he starts his conversation about spiritual gifts, making sure no one feels like they're on the JV team. That they're somehow insignificant or disqualified. That's not what he says. At the same time, the Christian church is not like a cult. Even though we're very similar, cults have the, the, the motive to turn everybody into the same thing so that everybody in the cult thinks the same, feels the same, acts the same. That's, that's what a cult is. The Christian church is far from that. It's supposed to be far from that. I know that because if I turn back a couple chapters and look at Ephesians 2, look at what Paul says also, and let this encourage you. Paul says, we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which is the spiritual gift stuff we've been talking about, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are God's handiwork. That is such an incredible word 
in the Greek. We can't even capture it in English. The Greek word is poema. It's where we get our English word poem. So what you hear right here in Ephesians 2.10 is Paul saying, you and you and you and me, we are God's works of art. I want you to hear Paul saying that to you. I want you to hear him say, you are a work of art. It doesn't matter how artsy you think you are or how artsy you feel. It doesn't matter how scuffed you think you are and how dirty you have been. It doesn't matter any of that. You were created to be a beautiful, irreplaceable, unique work of art. That's what the Christian church is. When you come into the church, you don't lose your individuality. According to Paul in Ephesians 2.10, you actually find it. You find what makes you unique, what makes you shine, what makes you glow. You finally find that when you do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. And that's what we've been talking about the last few weeks is God gives spiritual gifts to us that make us unique because there are people that only we can help. So let me, let me again ask you to hear Paul saying this to you. You are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for you to do. Do you believe there are only people you can help? But no one else can help in a way that will actually change their life maybe their destiny do you believe you were born with a person or a group of people that only you can help only the gift mix only the story you have granted your story and mine is similar in one sense we're all saved by grace but everyone's journey goes a bit different doesn't it looks a bit different. I want you to wrestle with Paul in Ephesians 2.10 and ask yourself, can I, can I believe that's what he's saying to me? Can I believe that I am his work of art, his poem? I hope so. So as we talk today, this, we're ending our series about how to discover spiritual gifts. And as we get into this part, let me offer a couple brief warnings about that before we get into it. Number one, when it comes to discovering the gifts that God has given you, where he's prepared in advance for you to do, when it comes to that, it takes a balance of you and the church to figure that out, the church body. It is not just your responsibility to figure out what your spiritual gifts are, and it's not just the church's job to figure it out for you. It's a combination. It's a balance together. Sometimes, have you ever filled out little surveys or studies of yourself and, it's, and you think it's brilliant and you show it to someone who knows you really well and they go, that's really not true. There's a danger when we try to assess and evaluate ourselves because we all have a skewed, limited vision of ourselves. Every one of us has our own set of blind spots, right? We all have our own wishes and our own ambitions and our own egos. Yes, even all the people in this room, we all have our own egos that get in the way of figuring out what makes ourselves tick. We even have a hard time doing it with others as well for the same set of reasons. That's why it takes everybody. So as a disclaimer... You've got blind spots just like I do. And you've probably found spiritual gift tests and inventories. Have you seen these and taken these? And you can do it. I just wouldn't put a lot of stock into it unless you start showing a number of people who know you who go, yeah, that sounds right. Or others go, no, you don't have the gift of hospitality. You don't like people. How does that keep coming up? You need someone who knows you well enough to be able to tell you that honestly if that's the case. At the same time, my disclaimer is, even though you have blind spots, you don't just get to sit back 
and say, well, I don't know what my gift is. The preacher said I can't figure it out on my own, so I'm just going to wait till someone asks me to jump in and help out. And it has to be three or seven times because that's God's magic numbers, apparently. So it's that you can't do that either. You can't just sit back and wait for the church to go, hey, I've, I've seen you in action, and after talking with you, I think you might have the gift of that. Oh, well, if you say that and a couple others do, then I'll consider that. Don't do that. It's not just the church's responsibility to get you in the ministry game, and it's not just yours either. It's both working together. The way I see it working is the church body stirs with needs. And as people, I look at those needs, I observe them, and I jump in. And then the church comes along again and says, yeah, you're doing really well at that. Or, who? what if you shifted a little bit? The church confirms you or slows you down. So number one, takes balance, okay? The second warning is avoid extremes. If you look in your bulletin, you'll see there's a list of needs that, that we thought through that, are, that we know currently in our church. And if you'll notice, there's space at the bottom because I can think of needs that aren't even on the list yet. I can think of all kinds of things that would help others experience hope. All kinds. I just don't know if we have the people for it. We've got ministries in place. We've got others that have never even begun, but I don't know if we've got the people who want to do that or not, who feel gifted or not. The extreme is, oh, let's see, nursery, nope, not my gift, uh, event coordinator, not my gift, prayer team, not my gift, uh, golly, none of my gifts are on here. Well, oh, the offering came by, I don't have the gift of giving, it's not my spiritual gift. I don't need to pass out bulletins or greet anybody, I don't have the gift of serving, that's someone else's. So one extreme is just to say, it's like a cop-out, right? It's not my gift. Just make excuses until no one ever gets in the game. Thankfully, I'll look at this group because it's kind of our, where they're sitting. Thankfully, we have a group of teenagers in our church who don't think like that. I am proud to be a part of a church who has a group of teenagers who say, hey, look, if there's a need, I'll jump in. I don't know if I'm good at it or not. If I can help, I'd love to help out. Now, I can tell you as someone who's been in church a long time, you guys are good. So thank you for all that you do. Up there, down here, all over the place. I, I don't want our teenagers to lead our church. I want them to watch adults do that over and over and over again and them go, yeah, that's why we're doing it because we're being inspired by our adults. I hope that's what's going on. So avoid the extreme of saying it's not my gift. But also avoid the other one. And this is the one that I have to work on. This is a warning for me. You can take it for years if you want. The other extreme is going, you know what? How come more people aren't doing this? I'm doing it. How come more people aren't involved in We Church? And how come more people aren't involved in the, the young people of our community? Uh, they're the future, right? How come more people aren't involved? I'm giving my blood, my sweat, and my tears to this. What's wrong with them? It should be their gift. Be careful about that extreme of becoming judgmental also. Both of those are bad. Saying, hey, it's not my gift. Sorry. Or getting angry at others not doing what you feel gifted at. So just avoid both of that. All right, now let's get into the discovery. This is actually the shortest part of the message, which I know won't make you sad. It's really a three-part process that I can figure out in terms of discovering your spiritual gifts. I know you're surprised that a pastor came up with a three-step process, but he did. So here's the three steps. The first one in terms of discovering how God has made you unique and what makes you tick and what he's prepared in advance for you to do is one, desire. What needs do you notice? This is an individual question, only you can answer. What needs do you notice that stir you emotionally? I call it the Popeye moment. Now, young people don't understand this because there was a cartoon a long time ago that was called Popeye. 
If you watch a Popeye cartoon, there comes a point somewhere in the story where he says, usually with anger, I've had, I can't do his voice, I've had all I can stand, I can't stand no more. And he has to intervene, and he takes some spinach, and boom, he solves the problem. That's the Popeye moment, when he comes to his breaking point, because he's seen all he can handle. He cannot sit back and watch anymore. He has to do something. It's called a Popeye moment, at least that's what I call it. Other smarter people have called it a holy discontent. What stirs with what injustices do you see that bother you? What can you not stand to see going? What do you believe really needs to change? And you can't say nothing. You live in a broken world. Something needs changing. There are a lot of things that need changing. But you personally, can you identify your desire? your holy discontent, your Popeye moment. What is that for you? That's the beginning. The second part is then opportunity. Is there an opportunity for you to jump in? You don't have to take the spinach, but you do something. And one way to gauge if there is an opportunity are others joining in your burden. Are you the only one with this burden, this holy discontent, or do others share the same thing? For instance, I have a massive burden that I don't know is shared. In a year of being here with conversations, I haven't heard it said at all. So that's why we haven't started. But there are couples in our church who've been married for 20 years, 25 years, and beyond, and have healthy marriages. Now, if you ask them, they would say, well, I don't know if it's healthy. I mean, but I would tell you, look, it's not perfect, no one's perfect, but you guys are together and you actually like being in the same room together. That's a big, you know, win right there. There are people like me who haven't been married 20 years, but would like to be. What if those people who've been married for a while came alongside of a couple that hasn't been married quite as long so they could bounce questions? How did you guys figure out where your kids were going to school? If you could go back and tell yourself something, like you can me, what would you say now? There are young families dealing with all kinds of problems. What if someone who's been widowed or widowered for a number of years could come alongside someone who's just now going through that and trying to figure out how to navigate life and emotions? Or anything. The loss of a job. A divorce. Now, I don't know that that is on anybody's radar. No one has said it would be great if older people invested in the younger people in our church. It's biblical, but I haven't heard anyone with a, a grand burden for this yet. I have a massive burden for it. If you have a burden for that, you come talk to me. But here's what it's going to require. It's going to require getting pretty open pretty fast. Because if you're going to be able to help people getting ready to go through life or going through some hard things, it means you have to own up and say, yeah, I, I actually had a divorce. I wish it wouldn't have happened, but it did. And If I could help anybody else navigate through that, great. Or I had some dark moments in my grief as a widow or a widower. If I could help anybody else, great. If that's something you think you would be able to do or you would want somebody that would be willing to share that with you, you need to let us know. You need to let me know. I can spearhead that in, in a New York minute. But I don't know if there's not a need. So right now, there is no opportunity for that. Because as far as I know, there's only one person with the need. But maybe there'll be more. So one is identifying a desire. Two is identifying an opportunity. There are others that share that same holy discontent that you have. And then the third one is fruitfulness. So once you do it, Others become built up, which is what we've talked about the last three weeks, which just simply means, how do you know if you jump in and try to help somebody if it actually helps? How do you know? Teenagers, how do you know if you're a good counselor? I know a lot of teenagers where your friends come to you with their problems, right? How do you know if you're good at it? Just because they keep coming may not mean they're good at it. It may mean they may not have anyone else to go to. It may be lack of options. How do you know if you're good at it? That could be all of us. How do you know? If they are being built up, meaning if they are reaching their potential in life through that, 
if they are experiencing healing and joy and godliness through that, well, then you know you're pretty good at it. How fruitful is it? But the only way you figure that out is you actually have to try. You actually have to get in the game and give it a shot. I have no idea how to figure out your spiritual gifts other than experimenting. And this is the best tip I can give you to try the experiment. Identify your desire. See if anyone else joins you in that and then give it a shot. And then let's see. Let's see if people are built up or not. And if they are, great. And if they aren't, well, let's shift your effectiveness. So the point is, don't be too aggressive, don't be too passive in finding your gifts. But just get in the game and experiment. As a church, it's not our job to tell you. We'll show you the needs. And if you see it in the bulletin one time, and then hear a song about it a second time, and then see it on Facebook a third time, and then go, yes, now I know God's talking to me. God is not a weird and bad communicator like that. That's not how he works. If you see it once, trust me, the need is real. If there's others that join in it, our job is to confirm it with you and applaud you or slow you down and maybe find you a different spot. I know this. You cannot grow spiritually without using your gifts. In fact, Christ told a story about someone, people who don't use their gifts, and he calls it evil. Wicked. So it's worse than not growing spiritually. But I also know this, and we've talked about it. You can use your gifts and not grow spiritually. You can be effective in what you do, and you and God are far apart. Because God can write straight lines with crooked pencils pretty easily. The gifts and the fruit are not always in the same line. They're not dependent upon one another. So here's the point. Here's how I'll end. Remember, you are God's poem. You're his work of art. Bask in that. Believe that. Rejoice in that. Be satisfied in that. And then, what is bugging you? And go do something about it.